Why could you call Khalsa? Why could you keep Fateh? My name is Gersant Singh, and as many of you may know, I was with this Yogi Bhajan Tantric Kundalini Yoga cult for about 30 years. I was in close contact with Yogi Bhajan and actually worked for Yogi Bhajan during the 1980s. I was also around him in Española, New Mexico, when he lived there, and that was during the 1990s until his death in 2004. Now, for the last 10 years, I have been speaking out and exposing the many lies and frauds that Yogi Bhajan did, and also talking and revealing about the abuses, both physical, sexual, mental, emotional, and financial, that Yogi Bhajan heaped upon his students. In 2012, I wrote a book, Confessions of an American Sikh. And I tell about many of my experiences with Yogi Bhajan, and then also about my experiences in 3HO in general. Now, about three months ago, Pamela Dyson, a top assistant to Yogi Bhajan, who I knew and worked for in Los Angeles during the early 1980s, she wrote a, a memoir as well. And it's called Premka, White Bird in a Golden Cage. Now, Pamela is, in what I believe, a truthful account of her interactions and time with Yogi Bhajan in her book. And she reveals many abuses that Yogi Bhajan did to her and other people, both sexual, physical, emotional, and mental. This has caused a real firestorm among the Kundalini Yoga community and among other Yogi Bhajan followers who are still loyal to Yogi Bhajan and his teachings. Now recently, there has been a movement or a campaign, if you will, and a very aggressive campaign too, I might add, by these former Yogi Bhajan followers. Not former, I'm sorry, the current Yogi Bhajan followers. To discredit people like myself, people like Pamela, and the many other former followers of Yogi Bhajan that have come forward with many stories of physical, mental, and emotional abuses by Yogi Bhajan. I think the last time I counted, there was about 16 or 17 separate accounts of abuse by Yogi Bhajan. These are all posted on a group in Facebook. It's called Premka, White Bird in a Golden Cage. So it has about 5,000 members in this group. And every day, there's more and more people coming forward that were abused by Yogi Bhajan. So what happened was a month or so ago, the sum of the leadership and the Yogi Bhajan organizations decided to hire a group, mediation group called an Olive Branch. And they gave them the task, gave Olive Branch the task to investigate these allegations. So an Olive Branch has been interviewing people like myself, people like Pamela and others, others about their experiences with Yogi Bhajan. A few days ago, I gave my testimony to them. And I recommend that people who were abused by Yogi Bhajan or witnessed abuses, call them or write them and give your testimonies. I think the more we can do to get this out into the open, the better.
Now I realize that 3HO and Yogi Bhajan organization has hired this group, but the ladies who interviewed me assured me that they would not redact any of the testimony that I gave and they were going to be making this public, all of their findings. For those who want to stay anonymous, that's okay. Um, but they wouldn't be redacting any of the material that was told to them. I actually recorded, with their permission, what was said in the interview, and I recommend anybody who uh, gives their testimony to do the same. Now, getting back to this aggressive campaign that's been started by the current followers that are loyal to Yogi Bhajan, there is a petition out there, there's about 3,000 signatures now, that was started by people that I know, and I knew when I was in 3HL or Yogi Bhajan's group. Now, I will say that all of these people had very little contact with Yogi Bhajan. And I believe this is why they just, in their own words, can't believe that somebody like Yogi Bhajan, who they see as being spiritual and creating all of this good works that help people, they say, how he is capable of being such a monster and abusing even children. There have been accounts by some who were children at the time that Yogi Bhajan abused them. Anyway, you can read about all of these accusations by former followers of Yogi Bhajan in this group, this Premka group. And I don't want to go into all the details of those, but they're pretty horrendous. And in my mind, they're very credible. But getting back to this petition and the people who are still loyal to Yogi Bhajan, I know for a fact that these people were not around Yogi Bhajan much of the time. Whereas people like Pamela and myself were in close contact with Yogi Bhajan. I worked on security at the 1620 Pruce Road, what they called the Guru Ram Das Ashram. And I answered the phones there. I was there full time, almost 24 seven a day. It was a job called the Savadaring job, it was called. I was paid a small stipend uh, for some time. And other times I was not paid at all for doing this. It was a purely seva or volunt voluntary uh, job. Anyway, so I was there night, day, and Yogi Bhajan's residence, if any of you have been there, is attached to the same building as 1620 Pruce Road. It's all part of the same building. Yogi Bhajan actually had an entrance that came out into the Gudwara where I used to sit there answering the telephones and doing this sevadaring uh, of the Siddhi Guru Granth Sahib, which is the Sikh scriptures, which is located also there. So I witnessed several instances where Yogi Bhajan physically abused students. I've gone into detail about this with the people at an olive branch and I won't go into that all here, but just suffice to say, I saw some of these instances of abuse by Yogi, but witnessed them. So I know what I'm talking about. People like Gurfata Singh Khalsa, who maybe some of you have seen, he's put this very aggressive campaign out there trying to discredit people like Pamela and myself. I've been arguing with Guru Fatta Singh for at least 10 years now. And he seems very belligerent about not listening to anybody who will try to sell anything, quote, negative about Yogi Bhajan. Um, he's really, uh, in my opinion, a fanatic, loyal Yogi Bhajan uh, cult follower is essentially what he is. 
he's put Yogi Bhajan up on this pedestal. And from what the comments I've seen from him is that he just doesn't even want to listen to these uh, people who are coming out with heartfelt accounts of how they were abused by Yogi Bhajan. So my point is, is that he was not there. He lived in Toronto and he says that this Grafata Singh says that he was in a 32 year correspondence with Yogi Bhajan and uh, talked to him often on the telephone or in, he says correspondence. But that doesn't mean that he was there. He's, he says, Grafata Singh says, this is not the man that I knew in my correspondence that is being accused of being this monster who has been accused of rape and sexual abuse and abusing small children. So my message to Grafata Singh and these other people who were not around Yogi Bhajan uh, to a great, great uh, extent, look at these testimonies because they were people who were with Yogi Bhajan. And just because somebody who you think cannot commit these crimes is uh, doing these crimes, it doesn't mean that they're not doing them. I know a psychiatrist who has dealt with many mass murderers and psychopaths and this psychiatrist told me that these psychopaths are the nicest people sometimes. You would never know that they have committed these horrible, horrendous crimes against people. They are very good at hiding who they really are. So it's not surprising that Gurfatta Singh and these other people who knew Yogi Bhajan uh, as a great spiritual teacher and all these things, they refuse to believe uh, that Yogi Bhajan could, could commit these awful, horrendous crimes. So, Grufatta Singh makes this argument, and then he also makes the argument that um, Pamela was paid to um, file this lawsuit against um, Yogi Bhajan back in the mid 1980s. Well, there's no proof of that. And I know for a fact that I have been accused of being paid by perceived enemies of Yogi Bhajan. Um, this is a very standard kind of strategy or narrative, if you will, to accuse someone who's trying to tell their story of being paid to do this. So they have some alternative motive and uh, to put this narrative out there. So I can say categorically that I've not been paid anything for telling my story, writing my book or um, making videos. This is something I do because I want the truth to be known about who Yogi Bhajan really was. Now, I also want to say that at the time I was working there at the um, Yogi Bhajan residence and the Guru Ram Das ashram. I, like I said, witnessed many of these abuses. I also witnessed women coming and going at all hours of the night and day from Yogi Bhajan's residence, single female women, uh, without escorts of their husbands or with escorts from other men. So I did not witness any um, per se sexual abuse by Yogi Bhajan, but he was very secretive, Yogi Bhajan, and he had big locks on his doors and big barricades. So it's understandable that people like myself who were on security would not have seen, actually seen, the actual physical abuse um, and sexual abuse. There were two places 
where Yogi Bhajan uh, lived most of the time. It was at the 1620 Pruce Road, which would, had big iron gates there, and then down at Dr. Allen's house. Uh, we refer to him as, as Dr. Allen Weiss's house. And that's where Yogi Bhajan spent a lot of his time too. He had a private room there. And <clears throat> I did a lot of security work outside the house. So again, I saw women coming and going all hours of the day and night. So then specifically, I'll say that on I believe it was July 30th, 1982. I remember the date. It was the date that Indira Gandhi came to Los Angeles. And so that night I was on security because Indira Gandhi had just been to Los Angeles and Yogi Bhajan had met with her and it had been a big day, basically. Um, he'd been at press conferences and things like this. So I was on security, I was answering the phones, and I was sleeping inside the Guru Ram Das Ashram at 1620 Pruce Road. Yogi Bhajan came out from the inside of his residence. That was uh, that side door that was just, that connects the Guru Ram Das Ashram Gurdwara to his residence. He came out, he was wearing his um, standard uh, brown tan um, shawl with his, just his kacharas on and what we call a house turban, an orange house turban. I remember it distinctly. And so I was sleeping on the floor. I'd already taken off my distar. That's another word for a turban, Sikh turban. And I was sleeping there. So he said, get up. We're going. Uh, I want you to take me to the estate. Now the estate is where Pamela had her residence. Um, and she talks about this in her book, Pramka White Bird in the Golden Cage. So Yogi Bhajan um, told me to take him up there. And I, I was working there for the secretariat, working for Yogi Bhajan, doing errands at the time. I was only in my early 20s. So I had this little tan Mazda that they had given me to do errands with. And it was a tiny little kind of station wagon, tan Mazda. I can still picture it. Anyway, when I, I got up uh, from where I was laying down, I started to put on my star. And Yogi Bhajan told me, no, no, just leave it. Let's go. I'm in a big hurry, you know, basically. And this is really, for all of you who are not Sikhs, uh, is really a biadbi or disrespect uh, to Sikhi because all Sikhs are supposed to wear the stars or turbans wherever they go and only take them off if they're sleeping or in the house. So I was trying to do my duty as a Sikh to put my star back on, but Yogi Bhajan said, no, 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 let's go. I, you know, this was really confusing for, for me because I was new to the religion, but, you know, I considered Yogi Bhajan to be my spiritual teacher. Anyway, um, the, the car was parked across the street from the Gurdwara and Yogi Bhajan, uh, I opened the door for him to the car and he squeezed into this little tiny Mazda. It was actually kind of comical uh, because he's so big and this car is so small, but he managed to get inside. So I took him up there and I actually asked him a question about the events that day because I was a student of political science and I asked him about uh, whether these people like Indira Gandhi, these leaders like Indira Gandhi, um, have power. And he says, well, I, Yogi Bhajan said, well, I, they think they have power. So actually, I considered that to be quite an astute um, answer to my question. And um, so Yogi Bhajan uh, said nothing more that I remember in the car while I took him up there. I dropped him at the estate, which is the estate, like I said, is where Pamela lived, and um, I posted pictures of it before the outside of it. It's just a house, normal residence on Pruce Road there. It's uh, just south of 1620 Pruce Road, about four blocks, I believe. So there was no lights on in the entire estate, 
And so I dropped Yogi Bhajan off there and he went inside. Now, I don't know what he was doing there or if he met Pamela or not, but this is a specific instance where I took Yogi Bhajan to residences, a residence of a single woman. Uh, and Pamela confirms again that there was secret sex between her and Yogi Bhajan in her book. So I'll leave it um, to all of you to put the things together that I have talked about here and see if you conclude whatever you conclude about it. But those are the things that I saw and witnessed. Now, I want to talk a little bit about Guru Tarat Singh Khalsa, who has published two letters, it appears, that Guru Fatta Singh Khalsa has shared on his website as part of this aggressive campaign to discredit Pamela and these new accusations to come out um, against Yogi Bhajan of sexual and physical abuse. So Guru Tarat Singh first introduces himself as a uh, learned and um, long-time attorney who has been dealing with uh, abuse cases, uh, sexual abuse cases, uh, for many, many years. And it is true that Guru Tarat Singh did deal with these cases in the 1990s, having to do with uh, sexual abuse of priests in the Catholic Church. Now, Guru Tarat Singh I had many interactions with Guru Tarat Singh, and he is a very capable attorney, no doubt. He was the um, lead, I don't want to say lead attorney, but he was very um, active, we'll say, in the lawsuit that was brought against Yogi Bhajan by Pamela and Kate Felt in the mid-1980s. And I remember Guru Tarat Singh getting up at summer solstice and telling all of us how there's been this uh, lawsuit filed against Yogi Bhajan and it's filled with lies and how Yogi Bhajan is being smeared and slandered and how we should support uh, Yogi Bhajan and give money to help defend Yogi Bhajan. So at the time, of course, I bought into all of these, this narrative and this propaganda. And then in 2009, roughly, I read a book by Dr. Talochan Singh, who really opened my eyes to how Yogi Bhajan twisted the Sikh religion to fit his Tantric and Kundalini Yoga agenda. And that I, I had always believed that Yogi Bhajan was teaching us true Sikhi. When in fact, after reading this book and talking to traditional Sikhs, I learned that Yogi Bhajan, like I said, was just twisting around Gurbani. He was violating the Sikh Rahat Mariyata, the Sikh Code of Conduct with all of his um, tantric practices that are completely against Sikhi. He was making up false narratives about how Kundalini Yoga, uh, the lineage of Kundalini Yoga was from the Sikh Gurus and that it had been passed secretly from uh, Baba Siri Chan, Guru Nanak's son, to Guru Ram Das, and then on just to Yogi Bhajan. And so, I learned that this was all a lie by Yogi Bhajan, how he had made up all of this stuff in order to make money and to give his Kundalini Yoga credibility, to give it a lineage, if you will. When in fact, Yogi Bhajan had really just made this all up. There's a great academic study 
Violet, uh, Philip Dislepi. Excuse me if I mispronounced his name, but he, in 2012, I believe it was, wrote a report, an academic study, which interviewed many um, people who knew Yogi Bhajan in the early days. And he did a lot of research showing Yogi Bhajan's Kundalini Yoga uh, was gleaned from a couple of different sources, like this Baba Versa Singh and this Brahmacharya. I can't pronounce his first name. Anyway, so you'll see a lot of Yogi Bhajan's Kundalini Yoga comes from these two teachers. And in fact, Yogi Bhajan incorporated some of these Sikh mantras into his teachings and then canned it as being a long thousands of year lineage that was unique to, hit, to Yogi Bhajan's practice. When in fact, all Yogi Bhajan had done is created a bro brokerage of teachings that came from this Baba Versa saying in Brahmacharya and made some things up too, basically. Anyway, so I realized this in 2009 after reading this Dr. Trilochan Singh's book. And Guru Tarek Singh Khalsa was aggressively involved in a campaign to discredit this New York Times. Um, Time, no, it was Time Magazine article that came out in 1975, which said that Yogi Bhajan was not teaching correct uh, the correct Sikh religion and that traditional Sikhs were against Yogi Bhajan. And Gurdjieff Singh made an aggressive campaign to discredit that. When in fact, it is true, Yogi Bhajan was twisting the Sikh religion. And I learned about this in Dr. Trilochan Singh's book and from other traditional Sikhs. So this is one of the biggest um, objections that I have to Yogi Bhajan's teachings, that he's appropriated the Sikh religion and that he's used it for his own ends, basically. Anyway, Guru Tarat Singh Khalsa has been instrumental in discrediting traditional Sikhs that oppose Yogi Bhajan. So I want to put that out there first. And in his little, in his messages, in his um, blog that I guess he wrote in February and March, he says that he's, he has been instrumental in discrediting these claims by Sikhs like myself and then also he's been instrumental in discrediting the claims by Pamela and other um, people who are coming out with these accounts of abuse by Yogi Bhajan. And he gives um, historical, Gurtarat Singh gives historical uh, accounts of the witch hunt in uh, Salem and he equates it with how uh, Yogi Bhajan is being treated. Well, <laughs> this is, uh, couldn't be farther from the truth because there has been a lot of accounts that are credible coming out against Yogi Bhajan and accounts that, that I can confirm um, have validity. Now, an important point that Gurdjieff Singh Khalsa makes in his um, rebuttal, if you will, or in his campaign against Pamela, is that in his experience um, with these lawsuits that went on in the 1990s that he was involved in against the Catholic Church, he was able to take depositions. And he talks about how uh, he took depositions of the um, 
people involved in these lawsuits, the Catholic priests, evidently, that were involved in these um, abuses against uh, children. Now, um, Guterres Singh does not mention that in the lawsuit that Pamela brought and Pamela and Kate brought against Yogi Bhajan, Yogi Bhajan refused to come to any depositions, even though he was subpoenaed five different times by this Peter Gregorio, who was Pamela and Kate's attorney. I talked to Mr. Gregorio, and I apologize again if I'm mispronouncing his name. And he told me that Yogi Bhajan refused to come to these depositions. He would always get excuses from his uh, Khalsa doctors or his 3HO doctors saying that he had a heart condition that um, he was not able to come to the depositions. Now, I can testify for a fact that Yogi Bhajan was perfectly able and healthy enough to come to these depositions because I was on security for Yogi Bhajan during that per exact period when these lawsuits were going on. And we would go to places like La Scala in Beverly Hills and spend thousands of dollars on lavish lunches where Yogi Bhajan was eating all kinds of very rich food. Um, there are these, you know, rich pastas and all these different rich foods. And there would be just this um, sea of Yogi Bhajan followers that would come to these lunches. And like I said, I was on security. And then afterwards, we would go to shopping in Beverly Hills, go to jewelry stores uh, where Yogi Bhajan's favorite place to visit. One in particular was this Jerry's there on Beverly Drive, where we'd go almost every day. And Yogi Bhajan would um, trade and barter jewelry and just have a great time there. Um, you know, exchanging, you know, it was thousands of dollars worth of jewelry that would exchange hands every time we'd go to this jewelry store. So, and then, and then we maybe would go to a movie after that in Westwood. Um, if you any are familiar with West LA, Beverly Hills, just drive down uh, to Westwood is not too far away and, and go to a movie there. Anyway, so my point is this, is that Guterres is just telling part of the story and he makes himself out to be this very credible and proficient um, attorney who knows all of the um, facts in the case. But the real fact is, is that he is on Yogi Bhajan's team. And I was involved in a real estate uh, transaction where Gudish Tarat Singh represented Yogi Bhajan. And um, let's just suffice it to say that um, in this transaction, Yogi Bhajan, I mean, Gudish Tarat Singh had Yogi Bhajan interests in mind and also his associates that were involved in this real estate transaction. And <clears throat> even though at my um, appeal to Yogi Bhajan and others, um, this lawsuit um, was um, brought against some clients of mine who were, um, I feel, uh, were basically conned into signing a contract. Now, later the lawsuit was dropped, but not before a lot of um, unnecessary um, anguish on the part of my clients was endured. We'll put it that way. So take it from me, um, good, people like Gurteret Singh, people like Gurfatta Singh, 
They all have a vested interest. Yogi Bhajan and his teachings are their lives. And if Yogi Bhajan goes down, if Yogi Bhajan's credibility is shown to be completely dishonorable, uh, then people like Gutierrez, uh, Singh Khalsa, people like Urfata Singh Khalsa, who Yogi Bhajan assigned, evidently, to be his personal biographer. Um, these people have a lot to lose. So it is completely understandable that they do not want to um, go down without a fight, we'll say, and they completely want to uh, discredit any kind of um, legitimate criticism or testimony about Yogi Bhajan. And I want you to all see that I am, like I said, not being paid to say any of this. I only want the truth to be out there. Now, after I finish here, I put a small clip to this Peter Gregorio's testimony, which you should all watch. Well, it's not really a testimony. It's actually a, um, a talk he gave about uh, lawyers that are involved in suing cults. And he, again, was the attorney for Pamela, who is known as Premka, Pamela Dyson, and Kate Felt. This was in the mid-1980s. And he, uh, Peter confirms in this lecture, this little talk that he gives about suing cults, that he tried to depose Yogi Bhajan at least five times and sent five subpoenas to Yogi Bhajan. Now, for any of you who have not been involved in a deposition, I think this is worth mentioning. A deposition is a place where the person who is the defendant or plaintiff in that matter, or a witness, will come and answer questions from the opposing attorney to get to the facts of the uh, case that's involved. And from my experience, I've been in about four or five different depositions, both being a plaintiff and a defendant. And from my experience, it is very difficult, um, if not impossible, to hide from the attorney uh, some matters. Um, it, it's very, very difficult. Um, and I've always been a big fan of um, giving my deposition because, you know, somebody who won't give their depositions, in my mind, is trying to hide something. I just just tell it all. Um, you may have all been um, uh, privy to listening to some of the media about how Donald Trump, our current president in the United States, would not give his deposition before the, um, this inquiry that was looking into um, accusations that he abused his power. So to me, when somebody will not give their deposition and either tries to hide behind some excuses like uh, medical problems or whatever. Um, this to me shows they're trying to hide something. They don't want to uh, appear before the lights, as this um, under the bright lights, this Peter told me. That's what Yogi Bhajan was trying to um, not appear under the bright lights and answer tough questions. So, to me, that really strikes home that Yogi Bhajan would not appear uh, for his deposition in this case. And I is trying to hide something when he won't even talk about the fact that Yogi Bhajan was subpoenaed five different times and wouldn't appear for the deposition. He talks about you know, how in his cases that he was involved in with the 
Catholic Church, how he deposed many individuals in there to get to the truth. Well, we didn't have that um, luxury or advantage with Yogi Bhajan. He would never appear in any depositions. So when people say that <clears throat> we should have brought these issues forward when Yogi Bhajan was alive, the fact is Yogi Bhajan wouldn't talk about them. He wouldn't come before a deposition and talk about them. So now we're left with the best next best thing is to talk about them after he after he died. So I believe that from all of these different people who are coming forward with these accusations of abuse, um, we will get to the truth um, with or without Yogi Bhajan. I don't think it really matters at this point. Um, and I think it gives, it tells volumes that, about Yogi Bhajan, how he would not even talk about these accusations. And anybody who did criticize him when he was alive, I experienced this myself. He would put down, he would call them, you know, um, cockroaches that did, you know, be born again as a cockroach. Um, he was just um, the worst when it came to um, accepting any kind of criticism. I remember once I was on the phone with him and he, he was asking me about some real estate deal. And um, because I, as I mentioned before, I was a real estate agent in Española. And he, he is asking me about this real estate deal. And I asked him whether he was a, he had a, um, he was a buyer's agent. He was a, he, he had a buyer's agent or he, he was, uh, he was being represented by the listing agent. And he said, don't try to teach me. And he just hung up the phone. He, he was completely closed to any kind of, um, criticism. There was another time when, um, I went against him and uh, wouldn't sell my house to him. He, my house in Española was uh, right next to the um, ranch, as they called it, just, just about 100 yards from his residence there in Española. And he wanted to buy my house. Um, and so he wanted it at a price that was so low that I wouldn't have had any other place to live um, or move to. Um, so um, I refused to sell it to him. And he kept on and on. Every time he would see me in public, he would go on about you know when I was gonna sell him the house and what a cheapskate I was for not selling him the house. Um, and I even heard from other people, uh, friends of mine who, um, heard him talk to others and he would say, get that croissant. He was very vengeful and he would do this to many people and tell lies about other people um, and just to get revenge on them. So he was, he was not a nice guy. And I want to um, tell those people who aren't around Yogi Bhajan that much that have been signing this petition to support Yogi Bhajan, um, ask yourself, um, if you were really around Yogi Bhajan enough to really see how he really was. Um, he, you know, I tell about many other stories I could go on. Um, there was that, that real estate deal, how um, that Gurt uh, Tarek Singh calls who was involved in later representing one of Yogi Bhajan's associates, this Swaran Singh from Vancouver. And uh, what happened in that deal um, I really found to be unconscionable. I was um, representing a nice Hispanic couple and they're in Española. And Yogi Bhajan wanted this Swaran Singh, who was a big timber magnet in Vancouver, to buy a place that was right near his ranch. And so this nice Hispanic couple um, had a mobile home on a nice lot that was a three quarters of an acre lot in the Walnut Circle subdivision. So I had it listed. I, I was the listing agent for this nice Hispanic couple. So Yogi Bhajan sent this Swaran Singh over to look at the house and I, you know, dutifully showed the house to Swaran Singh and told him the price. 
Um, and so the Swarnsing said, okay. And then he came back later and um, hit on this nice Hispanic couple. Um, and they were older and very vulnerable. That's why they had me as an agent because I was representing them. And evidently they, the Swarnsing sat down and strong armed them, would not leave until they signed a contract, a purchase agreement that was for a much lower price than what they, um, the market value on the house was. It was just really shameful what he did. So um, when the Hispanic couple told me about what had happened, after Swarnson left and got the signature on the contract, I was very furious to say the least. And I called up Swarnson and I told him, I, I said, my clients are not going to follow through with the contract. Um, you might as well just rip it up because they're not going to follow through with it. And um, so evidently Swarnson told Yogi Bhajan and Yogi Bhajan called me up and said, why did you do that? We would have paid you off. And he had no, Yogi Bhajan had no regard for this Hispanic couple at all. He was just really shameful. I, I really felt ashamed that I even considered Yogi Bhajan to be my teacher. This was one of the things that really uh, started to turn me off from Yogi Bhajan. And I told Yogi Bhajan, I said that, you know, they're my clients. They they deserve to have the, the money that is the fair market value for this house or whatever they want for the house. That's their business. And you have no right to, to um, intervene in this situation and try to, um, you know, con them out of their, their house. And what was even more shameful, the, the woman, who, the wife of, of the couple, she was sick and had cancer and she was even in bed um, at the time I, from what um, the uh, husband told me. And uh, while the sworn thing was hitting on them to try to get them to sign this contract. Anyway, it was just really awful. So there's a lot of stories like this, how Yogi Bhajan manipulated and conned people. Um, there are others too. I just don't have enough time to tell you all. You can read my book about it, about some of these other things. Um, and uh, this goes beyond the sexual and physical abuses, but there was a lot of financial abuse, uh, a lot of emotional and mental uh, abuse as well. So... Um, and there was also by a lot of his henchmen, these uh, people who were Yogi Bhajan's uh, right hand men, like this Hari Jeevan Singh, uh, who proclaims himself to be the chief of protocol for Yogi Bhajan. Um, Yogi Bhajan had sent me over to this Hari Jeevan's uh, boiler toner room operation where they, where we would call people on the phone and, um, uh, tell them all kinds of stories to get them to buy this toner and typewriter ribbons and everything. So, uh, again, I tell about all this in my book. And uh, Yogi Bhajan knew full well about these things. Um, at Hari Jeevan, he was eventually charged by the Federal Trade Commission in a field of schemes for selling uh, jewelry to elderly people at high, very high prices and promising them that... Um, it would be a great investment they, that they would even buy them back at a higher price. Anyway, as you can tell, my voice is kind of going here, so um, I don't want to go on too long here. But there's just all kinds of stories about Yogi Bhajan's abuses, which Guru Tarot Singh, um, if, even if I give him the benefit of the doubt and say that he wasn't around Yogi Bhajan that much, um, I still think he's trying to hide a lot. Because you think about it, he's got a lot to lose. Um, his whole life <clears throat> was oriented around uh, supporting Yogi Bhajan and propping him up as this great spiritual leader and that he's promoted all these things. Um, you know, I also just want to say real quick, for all of you who think <clears throat> Yogi Bhajan uh, was a great spiritual leader and he created this wonderful community yoga that helps people. Really examine if it really did help people. Um, there have been many scholars now, um, people who have studied <clears throat> yoga 
who say Yogi Bhajan's Kundalini Yoga was dangerous. And I believe that this really strong pranayama that Yogi Bhajan um, taught and these gong meditations, you know, all this holding the arms up for hours at end and, and making people extremely tired, um, that this is all an attempt to make people um, very tired and weak in order to make them more susceptible to uh, indoctrination into his cult. Yogi Bhajan was a, was a master manipulator and hypnotist. Um, I studied this neuro-linguistic programming um, and even was certified by this Bandler and, and Grinder in 1980, I think it was. I took a, um, a whole course in 1980 at the University of Santa Cruz and was certified in this neuro-linguistic programming. And from what I observed, Yogi Bhajan was a master at this neuro-linguistic programming, which is highly manipulative. Um, in these classes and courses that I took on NLP, they showed how you could hypnotize people and get them to do whatever you wanted to do. And Yogi Bhajan was a master at this. I really believe that Yogi Bhajan's Tantric and Kundalini Yoga was nothing more than a way for Yogi Bhajan to hypnotize people and get them indoctrinated into his cult so that he could abuse them and use them for power, money, and sex. So thank you for your time. And please watch this little clip from Pamela's um, old attorney. Uh, I think we'll give you some real good insights into what Yogi Bhajan was really like. Why could you call Sa? Why could you kifate? Some need to fight in order to keep the faithful interested. One of the big challenges of being a cult leader, it seems, is always having some dramatic thing going on to keep everybody stirred up. Uh, another big reason is that management, and when I use the term management, I mean the chief Mahuff and his close circle of lieutenants who actually run the group. Uh, management cannot be perceived as being less than invincible or less than invulnerable. If you bring the big yogi in and sit him down in the deposition room and force him to answer your questions and cross-examine him when he lies to you, and you catch him in lies, the mere fact that he has to respond to your notice and the mere fact that he has to be there is evidence that he does not make the world turn. And that's a political problem. I never was able to get Yogi Bhajan into a deposition in a year and a half of litigation. Every time he came up for deposition, he would have one of his followers who was a medical doctor write in the medical excuse. And the judge let him get away with that five times. So that he couldn't come and testify because that would be answering to another authority. Not my authority, it would be the authority of the court, but in the group it would be perceived as my authority. And now there's some question about who the chief buff really is. So they fight you for that reason. The ones who leave, under no circumstances, can be seen to prevail. One of the things I've learned about at least those groups that I worked with is, when you leave, you're defamed. He's going to die now, he's left the protection of the spiritual protection of the Guru, so he's going to be reincarnated as a cockroach, or the negative energy is going to get you now that you're out in the world, or the devil will occupy you, I'm just going down the list, uh, you, will, you will no longer realize your full potential and, and you'll be unhappy the rest of your life. Those are four of the ones I can think of. Well, that kind of all goes to hell if the person recovers a big money judgment against the group and walks away with cash. All of a sudden, they are powerful and they have succeeded and you see them in court and they're no longer ash and gray and they're wearing nice clothes and people are shaking hands and everybody's smiling. Well, management has a real problem with that. The litigation is a serious threat to their internal control. So they, they, they fight you for non-economic reasons, and that makes it hard on a lawyer. Throughout all of this, you're going to hear money talked about.
point which I want to discuss with you. It is about rape. I have heard a lot of different versions. And some people have asked me a lot of questions and I never answered that. Today I want to talk to you about it. First of all, nobody can be raped until you do not invite it. Rape is always invited, it never happens. A person who is raped is always providing subconsciously the environments and the arrangements. If you do not provide the circumstances and the arrangements, it is impossible. <coughs> 